right, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the New Ridgeline Podcast. I'm Devin Dunnigan, and here with me today, as always, is Mr. Stephen Mott. How you doing, brother? Great, brother Jake. All righty, so today we are back, and we are going to be talking about QR3, a.k.a. Quiet Riot 3, from 1986, released July 6th. 19 Ju- released July 6th, 1986 to be exact, couldn't talk, but produced by Spencer Proffer and John Perdell. And this is their fifth studio album, but is listed as being their third. This is actually their third major label release. So this is technically between the first two albums with the entirely different lineup and then these albums, it's technically the fifth album, but really and truly for the major label that they were on at the time, it's their third release. This was recorded from late 1985 to mid 1986. This adopts a much more commercial keyboard laden sound compared to the more heavier guitar led material of the previous records the first album to feature bassist chuck wright as an official as an official member (laughs) man i can't talk and yeah he stayed in the band up to here recently and then he he left and now rudy sarzo has came back into the band and yeah i mean he was kind of an off and on bass player throughout their career he would leave come back leave come back he was on these sessions then he was gone it was it was he was just kind of a on and off bass player for the band i guess i wouldn't say session player but he was just kind of there in the background he was kind of they couldn't get one they had him there so went number 31 on the u.s billboard 200 the first quiet ride album to feature no cover songs and there was at least one commercial single off the record, which I'll get to a little bit later when we do the track by tracks. Two videos made to support the record, and this was the final album with Kevin Dubrow, or Dubro, I've heard it pronounced both ways, until 1993. He would be fired after this album, actually. But yeah, I discovered this album, man, it was a few years ago i was i hadn't really gotten into this band that much and i was i knew who quiet riot was because of the the singles they had put out come on feel the noise and bang your head metal health stuff like that and i remember seeing a video to one of the songs on here on metal mania they were doing a it was like 30 years of the headbangers ball i think it was and it was the whole entire weekend of nothing but heavy metal music videos i remember seeing a video for one of the songs on here and i thought it was so freaking weird because this was not the sound that i knew quiet riot for and yeah it was kind of surprising and eventually i came around to this record listen to it honestly i didn't take i didn't think very much of it i remember it just being a very commercial keyboard electronic sounding album and i didn't go back to this album for a few years and then i eventually listened to it again i didn't hate it as much as i did then i came around a, a few of the songs on here and then I I listened to it here and there, and then I'm, of course, prepared for this episode by listening to it. So, yeah, overall, I mean, I'll get into the album as we go track by tracks, but I will say this this is not a, the best album in the world, in my opinion. I'm not going to try to spoil what I think of the individual tracks. I, I, I really and truly, it, it's passable. It's not great, and it's definitely not good it's and but it's not really what i would consider to be a horrible album so kind of in the middle on the fence i guess you would say and you're going to see by my rating that i feel that way as well so steve give me or give us your first thoughts on quiet riot three well 
Quite right. Three, QR3, the album cover I would like to start with, the subject of that. It is quite the, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, quite the intrustation. Um, and I like to make up words. But, um, I mean, if the, if you look at the whole thing, I mean, I, don't, I mean, it looks somewhat plain, but also if you look closer, then you can see a guy, a wide-eyed guy with a mask on, I guess. And, um, I mean, you know, this is like something maybe from a horror movie. So it's quite interesting. But, uh, and when I first saw the album cover, I thought it said OR3, like quite right OR3. And I was like, what? And then I looked closer. But besides the point, I had no clue about Quiet Riot before this. It's the first album I've heard by them. Not the first song I've heard by them. Because, um, you know, like, uh, Feel the Noise, I guess it's called, or something like that, I've heard on the radio. But um, Feel the Noise, you know, whatever it's called. Um I've heard that on the radio, and I, I mean, I honestly, I didn't even know what the band was. But uh, thinking about it, it is a little bit different sound than this record. But that's that's the only one I really know of. But this is my first time really hearing "Oh, Quite Right," to be honest, and my first impression. So uh, anyway, back to you, Devin. All righty. So just to piggyback off of you about the album cover, I think the album cover totally freaking sucks. <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of this album cover. I get what they were going for, and you have kind of the mascot of the band in there, the guy with the mask on. He's on every one of these freaking albums, except I think the one after this he's not on, but he's on every other one, I believe. But, yeah, let's go ahead and dive in to this record with the very first freaking song on here main attraction so right off the bat this is very 80s sounding with the keys and stuff in there the riff is very mid 80s sounding very anthemic song a very good opener in my opinion and i, I dig it i think it's a, a pretty good song and it also kind of reminds me of Solo Sammy Hagar kind of reminds me of something like the album, the song he did, I believe it was the movie Over the Top or Winter Takes All or something like it was a soundtrack song he did while he was in Van Halen. I, I can't remember what it was called exactly. It's on one of his greatest hits albums that I have. And overall, I like it. I think it's good. And the keyboards are really prominent in the song so the guitar is very very low in the mix in this song and i listened to this on a a good radio and I, it was kind of hard to hear the guitar except when the solo and all came in but the breakdown before the solo i thought was pretty interesting a really good solo carlos cavazzo i mean he delivers he should be in rat right now <laughs> And this has a very commercial metal sound. So, Stephen, what is your thoughts on Main Attraction? Well, Main Attraction. <clears throat> I think this is a great opener. I always, every time I've, tr I've listened to this record, which has been a good amount of times, three or four, uh, you know, in preparation for this, this episode. And... Um, Track number one, main attraction, is a really, I mean, I did just the intro, the keyboard intro is just a really good way to open an album and just a cool little part. <laughs> and, that, and that part kind of, it's up under a lot of the song. And, and there's keyboards throughout this song and throughout this whole record pretty much. And uh, I think I like that kind of quality. I liked, I actually like the production on this record. And I think I think that's the best thing about this record is the production. But the, uh, a lot of the songwriting is really good. Like this song, the songwriting, this is one of the best ones of, you know, of the best of the record. And, um, you know, of the of the best, the best half of this record, let's just put it that way. Uh, 
And that's and besides that great and fine point, um, to the great and fine listeners of this podcast, um, this is a really good song. And um, that's all I got to say, pretty much. And it's it's just it's a it's it's just kind of some of the guitar parts and things within it is, and the keyboard parts the way it's written overall is a little bit unique, but not totally. But but some of it it's it's like they they were they were good at being a little bit uh, creative with it. But uh, anyway, without getting too off the wall. Back to you, Devin. All righty. And just to piggyback off of you again with the whole thing of the production, I actually like the production as well. I, I like kind of how everything flows together. I like the sound of the record. And so the next song on here is The Wild and the Young. So once again, very anthemic. Probably my favorite song on this record. Once again, very 80s with the synth. This was the lead off single from the record. And this is probably, of the songs on here, the most in vain of the previous two records. There may be a couple of other ones. I can't remember what I put out in my notes. But this is still played live today. They, this has stayed in the set list. A video, of course, was made for this song. I, I saw it a couple of times. I believe it's just a performance video of the band with like a bunch of other little, I believe it may have been like in a mental asylum that was going back and forth. I could be misremembering that. I've saw it a few times. I just can't remember much about it. And I just put simply yes. <laughs> and then a great solo. I think, I mean, like I said earlier, Carlos Cavazzo is a great guitar player. And the breakdown after the solo and all is very 80s electronica. It's very electronic sounding with the keyboards and all and the, the effects on the drums and stuff like that. And great voice in Kevin Dubrow. I mean, Kevin Dubrow, Dubrow, I've heard it pronounced both both ways. People pronounce it different ways. I'm just going to go with Dubrow for this episode. But I think Kevin Dubrow has a really, really great voice and very underrated voice in metal. And he's, he's just a really good singer. So, Stephen take the wild and the young well i really really like this one this song and uh yeah i i think i think this one if i mean i'm assuming it was a single for i think this was one of the one music with the music video um but i'm, I'm kind of going out on the limb there but i'm pretty sure it is good single choice there and um no rock and roll <laughs> I, I just kind of, I just kind of quoted something from the music video there in my notes. I got confused for a second. I was like, "Wait, what?" And that's oh, you know, the, it starts with no rock and roll, no rock and roll, you know, and uh, very, very interesting and eccentric music video. I kind of like it, and um, very keyboard heavy as for this whole album, and. Um, the Wild and the Young, I mean, it's just a really, really good song. That's all I got to say. The songwriting for the first half of this record is just top-notch. And it sounds very thought out. And, uh, like, they really, you know, knew what, you knew, knew what they were trying to do with it. And, um, I mean, I think they were trying to sound a certain way. And because the record company was... It seems like they were probably pushing for a really a big, a big seller uh, because, you know, it, I mean, it came out in 86. If, I, if, if YouTube is right, I believe I read it on there. And um, I'm not sure if Devin's already said that or not because I wasn't listening, obviously. But in 86, it seemed like a year for, for pop albums, you know. But it seemed like a very... Uh, rich time musically in general you know during that period that year and that whole 80s period you know but um, I, I think this this record is is really trying to it seems like it's trying to fit into that and it, I think I think it, it really this song well, this song it really does really well and um, anyway so 
Back to you, Devin. All righty. And just talking about the keyboards and stuff on the record as well. I mean, I had I didn't realize how much of the keyboards were on here. I thought there was just like a few songs that had keyboards here and there, but the rest of the album was more guitar oriented. But yeah, I was totally misremembering that. I was listening to it. I'm like, no, this is a keyboard album. So the next song on here is Twilight Hotel. So a video was made for this song, which is very freaking off the wall. This is the one I was talking about. I saw first when I first discovered this record. It is one of the most weird off the freaking wall videos I've ever seen. It's like a, a little girl playing with a dollhouse with Kevin DeBro as a like a figure, and it, it is so freaking odd. I, I don't know. I I know what they were going for. It's it's very kind of oddball eighties, and I mean you had a lot of weirdo videos in the eighties, but man really really freaking odd but the song of course is very 80s i mean it's very keyboard heavy you're gonna hear 80s come up a lot hearing this probably but i really do like the song i think it's a good kind of melodic pop pop metal song and a really good solo once again i mean you're gonna hear that a lot i mean a lot of the, the notes i took for this album were very kind of cut dry they were very this is good, this is bad, this is good, maybe this is could have been better, and then it's going to be a lot of that throughout the remainder of this review, but yeah, really good solo, I mean, I, I thought it was really, really great, and the outro solo was really cool as well, so Stephen, take Twilight Hotel. Another one that, I mean, I say this a lot in podcasts, but it really, I mean, I really do think this is the way it goes, like, they kind of start off an album with a certain amount of tracks and whether it be two, three, four, five, something, something in that range and that they, that they've got together and they say, well, this stuff's really good. So let's just make a whole record out of it, you know? And this, the, the first, I mean, pretty much first half, almost first half of this record is like that. Is in my opinion, it seems like I think all of these in the same vein. They're really, really good songs, and uh, they they kind of they kind of tend to want to push the really good ones to the front. So when you when a listener listens to the album, they kind of say, "Oh, well, I'm going to stick with this," you know. But toward the end, it, the quality kind of drops some. But um, I think they kind of push the best ones to the front. For that reason, you know, it, it seems like the, the on an album in general, the singles are gonna are, are gonna be kind of to the start of the record. You know, that's kind of the best way to go, pretty much, from what I've seen. Uh, the kind of a trend I've seen, you know, and uh, but anyway, I really like this song, and and what stood out to me the most is the, is the vocals. I mean, just great, tremendous vocals. And uh, I don't know a lot about this band, but I mean, I will say, I, I mean, the singer is great and the band is, you know, pretty decent sounding too, but the singer is really spectacular. What's, what's you know, really stood out. And um, I mean, it, I guess it's kind of a, maybe one of those bands that have a different sort of lineup every album or whatever, I'm guessing. But for this, it, I mean, this it worked that well. Whatever they whatever band they chose for this record, they should have stuck with my IMO. But you know, anyway, there's not much I can say about the song itself. It's just a really good song. I mean, that's all I got to say. It didn't remind me of anything in particular. It's just a good song. So back to you, Devin. All righty. So the next track on here is Down and Dirty. Oh my, so here we go. So this is the stereotypical sleazy song on the record. I put in my notes, what is this exactly? What am I listening to? The verses are almost a freaking train wreck. I mean, it's it's all over the freaking place. I dig the chorus, though, even though there's really nothing to it in terms of like, like subject or whatever or I mean, it's just, 
it's okay, but there's really nothing going with it. The keyboards are all over the freaking place during the verse of this song. I put, oh my. And this is pretty much a terrible song, but I don't hate it. <laughs> and the bridge is kind of off the wall toward the middle of the song. I don't really even like the solo that much. And I put, okay, yeah, no, yes, no, filler and a crappy song. So, Stephen, take down and freaking dirty. Oh, uh, yeah, sounds like some texting lingo there being used but <laughs> oh my yeah that oh by the way i seen on i don't know if it's this way on the actual cd you know but it um, on youtube it says d-o-w and dirty without the n on youtube i noticed that but anyway i kind of figured it's it a was typo. down i, fi- I kind of figured it was down but like i saw a doe when i was like Okay, well, maybe they're trying to be different, but I, no, nah, I'm just kidding. I know it was, it was, you know, not dough, but <laughs> that, uh, okay, dough and dirty, uh, so bad, I literally slept through this song. It was so bad. So true story, I was, I was listening to this record earlier today, and like all the other songs, I, I mean, I was just kind of laying back in bed, just listening to it, and then. When it got to this track, track number four, I just went on kind of just to the to the sleep, and it was just right when it started with number five, I, I just woke right back up. It just it was so bad, I, it just put me to sleep of just with its horribleness. It was just that bad. So, um, I, I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, I, it's just horrible. I mean, who would put this crap out? Who would listen back to this and go, wow, you know, I, I guess this is a great job, guys. Yeah, real sleazy. Yeah, this is this is great. Yeah. I mean, horrible. So back to you. <laughs> All righty. So the next track on here is Rise or Fall. So I dig the riff. It kind of sounds like the previous two albums that they did. The opening is pretty okay, but it quickly tapers off. This is filler. Nothing really stands out to me that much on the song. And it kind of has potential, I think, but is just not quite thought out. A good guitar solo, and I love the electronica feel during the breakdown. Kind of reminds me of 80s style Rush, like Power Windows and hold your fire and stuff like that. I like the bass and drums and all of that in there in the breakdown and a good outro solo. That's it. That's verbatim notes, as you always say. So, Steve, take Rise or Fall. Verbatim notes, track number five, Rise or Fall, dash. Continuing with the pop keyboard stuff, comma, nothing. (laughs) Because I didn't finish the notes, and I see why. Because... I wanted to go ahead and get through this song because it it's an album track and unfortunately so at that. Um, it's bad and it's not, it's, just, it's not horrible, but it, it's just, it's just like, okay. I mean, you, okay, that's good. That's, that's good keyboard sound, but the song I mean, it doesn't just have a whole lot to it, and um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed this to my dog essentially. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, rise or fall. If I, if I could choose whether this song rose or fell, I would choose fail. <laughs> so back to you, Dev. <laughs> All righty, so the next track on here is Put Up or Shut Up. So the first note I have on here is Get Out. And it's not horrible, but once again, it, it is freaking filler. Not a, I put, once again, not amazing, but passable. So, I mean, same freaking notes either way. You show how much I was paying attention. I put Turn That Down. No. Oh, my. Yes, no. And then the music itself reminds me of old school kiss. 
<laughs> and the chorus is pretty stupid and annoying. And the drums are really cool on this song. The drums are good all throughout the album. Frankie Benali is a very great drummer, underrated. And I mean, it's unfortunate that he passed away. I mean, rest in peace, Frankie Benali, a great freaking drummer. He kept this band going even after Kevin Dubrow passed away in 07. But yeah, I do like the drums on the song and I like the drums on the album itself. I like the solo quite a bit. It's to me kind of a mixture of Eddie Van Halen and Jimmy Page. And I just put O oh, and then the song can shut it up now. And very bland once again with a little work. This could have probably been better. It kind of sounds more like an idea than an actual song. Sort of like a like they demoed the song, but it ended up just going on the album as it was. So Stephen Tate, put it up or shut it up or, or just whatever. So get on with it. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna put it up and shut up, because uh, if I ever bought this record, like if, if I mean it would definitely be an accident. It would be a it would be an accidental button I pushed on Amazon and it showed up and I was like, dang. So I I just I just put it up up in the closet for good, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll never let it come out of the closet either. So, um. This is a this is an album track, and uh, it's definitely on the album. It's and a it's song, six, and it's on the album. It's definitely the sixth track on the on the record, and uh, it should have oh been my. left off. It should have been left off, and um, it should have been at least eight or nine tracks on the record. Shave off at least two, at least, and that's that's. That's generous. So, this song is bad. Very bad. So, back to you. All righty. So, the next track on here is Still of the Night. So, not to be confused with the White Snake song that came out a year after this. This is the ballad. This is the ballad on the record. Very 80s. The chorus is very freaking 80s. I do like it. And whoever the high vocals are, whoever's doing the high vocals, I saw who it was earlier. I can't remember who it was, though. They could shut up on this song. I mean, Kevin DeBro didn't need any freaking help. And why wasn't this the single? This would have been a good choice as a single. I think they could have actually done pretty well with this as a single. Seems tailor-made to be a single. And a very good solo and kind of puts me in the mood of nostalgia for like the eighties. And I was, I was not born in at all, even close to the eighties, but it, it, when I hear something like that, I guess if it's like, if it's dated to me, you kind of get like a nostalgia, like you kind of, you get a nostalgia for like that time period or something, even though you weren't there to experience, you just kind of get a, you get the vibe. This is what the eighties were. And this is to me, this is kind of, quintessential 80s i mean the feel of it the sound of it the, the mood it sets everything so steve takes still of the night well <clears throat> yes great great song um great album great song great album great song um cool guitar intro and great song comma great keyboard effects in the song comma takes it to the next level and Dash in 86. A very popish year for music, apparently. It seemed like every band was making a pop album. But really good time for music in these days. So, like Devin said, I mean, I wasn't around, I wasn't hatched or thought about during this time period. But, I mean, from what from what I've heard that, that was from this time was pretty rich musically, you know. And um, anyway, besides that point, really good song. And I'm like you, like if it was me, I mean, I, it, I, it wouldn't have been the only single off the album, but this would definitely be one of them if it was me, you know, and I was choosing the record company singles, which I'm not. But um, anyway, this is a really good song 
and I, I mean, just the overall vibe of it, it is really good. Kind of like the first couple of songs, about three songs on the record too. I kind of think of those, those, this one and those first three in the same vein. And uh, I think they just kind of moved this one to the back, just kind of, or you know, not to the back, but more to the middle of the album, just to to kind of break up the the monotony of the badness because <laughs> from here on out it's it's horrible it, it it goes downhill and craps over and never comes up for air so back to you devin all righty so i will agree with you there about the, talking about the singles and stuff I, I i probably wouldn't have made this the only single but i probably would have put Wild and Young out as first single. This is the second single, and another one coming up as the third single. I think that would have helped a lot on this album. But the next track is Bass Case, <laughs> an instrumental. So this was an instrumental to showcase Chuck Wright, the bass player. I, I don't mind it too, too much, but it's pointless. I mean, it really is a, like, maybe 40 seconds long or something. It's not very long at all. It's here and there and gone before you can even say anything. And it's, it's just kind of pointless to me. It's very 80s sounding with the effects and stuff like that. If that's, that's the only thing I kind of really dig about it is like the very 80s bass tones and all of that in it and the effects. And this isn't even listed on the back of the CD I have for it. I could not. I almost called this the title of the next track in my notes because it was not on the back of my album. And so then I looked it up. I was like, wait a minute. Free, this is a freaking. There's another song on here called what I'd called this. And then I looked at it and it said, no, it's bass case. And I said, oh, shoot. Well, why didn't they put that on the back of the album? Unless it was supposed to be like an interlude to the next track, which it really would not fit at all to be. So, Stephen, take bass case. Well, uh, this was the case of the bass that was was bad. Um, that was the worst analogy that I've ever made, and this is pointless. The eighth track on the record, no. I mean, this is just, I, I mean, my notes literally say bass case dash stupid, and that's it. I mean, I just, it's, it's not even good. Like, it's not, e I mean, you know, the reason bands do this kind of stuff is for, like, to break up the monotony in a record, you know, just to, just for something off the wall and humorous or whatever, just to be different. But in this case, I mean, I'm just like, no. No, no, no. Don't say you will if you won't. I mean that that's all I could say with this. I mean this album said it it will but it didn't. And that's that's a quote from Gene Simmons and I'm going to quote him for, on this podcast. And and by the way that's a great song. But besides that point this is not a great song. So back to you Devin. All righty. So the next track on here is The Freaking Pump. So, oh my, another sleazy song, and I just put simply, your mom, this is crap, what am I listening to, no, oh no, and no, 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 the chorus is annoying and makes no freaking sense, oh, random crap, I fell out of a chair because of this song, and there's no real solo on this song, that I, I can even re remotely remember, except for some stuff at the end, which is just kind of like an ad-libbing type thing. So, yeah, this is a piece of crap. This, this is probably, in my opinion, this and Down and Dirty or whatever it was called, that, 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 that it's probably they both are probably tied as the worst songs on this freaking record. I mean, th this is a freaking horrible freaking song. I mean... Really? I mean, why Why would you do something like this? <laughs> April 14th, everyone. So, Stephen, take uh, the pump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost forgot what it was called because it's so bad. 
number nine. I mean, and you feel every second of this. I mean, it, it, it's just bad. I mean, album track, comma, filler, comma, bull, ver <laughs> verbatim notes. And, um, I mean, I got, I will give them this, like the punk, it seems like a very original album. I mean, album title track, uh, you know, for, you know, this particular song, but, um, that's a title track. I, I, sound, I mean, that sounds different, but I mean, it's a good title for this particular track, but anyway, um, the pump, I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, it's not good. Uh, this, the, toward the end of the record, it seemed like, they just said, man, we got to get this crap out within this due date. So let's just go in the studio. You lay down a reel. Just just come up with the most random, just typical, generic rock riff you can and just, just lay it down. And put keyboards over it. Make it sound, you know, this this appease to let's appease the producer and the record company. Make it let's make it sound, you know, like the rest of the album production wise and popish. And crap it out. And, um, you know, flush it down, and that's pretty much what happened. And um, this is bad. I mean, I'm running out of stuff to say. Like, toward the end of this record, I will say this. It sounds like they were very desperately, to me, trying to make it sound a certain way with the songwriting and the overall production and just it sounds forced because it sound it seems like they were just trying so hard to to appease the record company with this stuff like they probably told them look if you if you don't do it this certain way and it doesn't sell then you're out you know i mean that's, that's what i'm guessing i mean because that's what this seems like it seems forced so Back to you, Devin. All righty. So the next track on here is Slave to Love. So has a very 80s feel. I actually like this song quite a bit. I actually pulled out a lyric that stuck out to me. You're the hunter. I'm the game. Since we met, I'm not the same. I actually like that lyric. And I love the chorus a lot. The chorus is extremely freaking 80s. And this should have been a single. This... I would have put The Wild and the Young out, and then Still of the Night, and then this is the third single. I think this would have been a perfect choice. It has a cool solo, but it is nothing that special in my opinion. It's, it doesn't really stick out to me as much as some of the other ones on here. And I said, I put on here, I had to took, take a minute to remember what I was talking about in my notes here, but I'm slowly easing back to my being my critical self after the previous album where I was kind of being very positive, but yeah, this record, I'm kind of nitpicking a lot of stuff out and that's what I mean. I was confused there for a second, probably the most pop oriented song I hear in terms of like something like you would hear like, probably a bad example, but maybe like a Michael Jackson or someone like that or a Madonna or something like somebody like that and a good outro solo. So that's it. That's all I have to say about Slave to Love. So Stephen takes Slave to Love. One word verbatim notes, decent. And that's about all I got from it. This in unagreement with Devin should not have been, I mean, this is not a bit of single. This should not even be on the album. It should not be in existence. I mean, I mean, this is just like, okay, slave to love, okay? That's a very typical sounding song name. And the song itself, once again, they were trying to sound a certain way, seems to me like, and they were just putting stuff together before time limit. And I don't know. 
that's just the way it seems to me. And like, no matter how many, usually I can warm up to stuff, but the more I've listened to this record, like the, the, the latter half of this record, I just cannot get into it, no matter how hard I try. Usually I can with stuff. The more I listen to it, the more I can catch on and understand how people could like it. But this, I just don't see how people could like this. This this latter half of this record, I just I just have not been able to quite grasp. You know, put it like you know, I try to put a finger on like why people like it, like it in the first place. You know, and that's what I try to do and try to understand it a little more. But this, I just quite can't. But anyway, that's a tangent. But Slave to Love, I don't particularly like it. It's Anne. So back to you, Dad. All righty. So the final track on the record is Helping Hands. So the riff of the song kind of reminds me of Led Zeppelin, another anthemic type song. Listening back to this song, this is pretty much the song slided in by Whitesnake, rewritten. And I don't hate it, but it's pretty much filler. I see what they were going for and kind of the message, but it didn't quite, it wasn't quite executed that great, in my opinion. Once again, sounds like an idea instead of a coherent song. Decent solo. Okay, I've got the idea. Just please finish. That's what I put on here. So get finish the album. Just get on with it. And it also kind of reminds me of the song Find Somebody New by Molly Hatchett, which came out after this album. So, Stephen, take Helping Hands. Number Track number 11, last track on the album. Helping Hands. I mean, no, it's just bad. I mean, I agree with Gene Simmons once again with his quote, no, no, no. Because this song, I mean, it's just not. It's just not anything. And it's just like trying to, it's, it's like trying to pull a turd out of a hat. I mean, it's just not going to happen because there's no turd in that hat or in the toilet. <laughs> and um, I got a feeling a lot of this is going to be edited out. Um, on on the latter end of this episode, so uh, I'm going to be looking forward to that, Devin. Um, so uh, I'm going to flip myself off and keep going. Helping hands. This song is just. It was that bad. I mean, no one could not describe. How I mean, one could not could come up with a with a you know a description that that actually accurately describes this song bad enough. Like, it's bad. Like, it, it is actually turd brown bad, okay? I mean, I'm looking around my room for something to compare it to, but I just can't because nothing can measure up to it. I mean, this this record drug, it just goes on and on and on, and it should have been eight tracks. I'll go ahead and say that right now. Should have been eight songs, and it would have been um, it would have been maybe uh, eight or nine eight out of ten. But um, it was not that. So we're going to get to my rating a little later, apparently. Um, but let's just say it wasn't eight or nine. Back to you, Devin. All righty. And talking about falling out of a chair, yeah, th- th- this also made me fall out of a chair. Talking about that earlier. I didn't really give any freaking context to that, but me and Steven have an inside joke about a video of, of a person falling out of a chair and something very interesting happens. So that's the album. And pretty much my conclusion is this is overall not a terrible album, but just not as good as the previous two that came out. It has some good songs, some decent ideas, and some outright terrible songs. That's what I put. Overall, I give this a four out of ten. That's probably very, 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 very harsh. But I, like, I don't hate the record, but I think it's more or less middle of the road than it is anything else. I think about half the record is decent. But then the rest of it is just fillerish junk. And this was very much a humongous example of 
a band going more commercial because of a drop in album sales. I mean, the first record they did with Metal Health was a humongous success. It was the first metal album to go number one on the charts. And when the second album didn't sell that great, they were like, oh, shoot, let's do something commercial. Let's get the sales back going again. And I just think that they second guessed themselves and I'm sure it was the record label that was pushing them in that direction. I'm sure it was not them going in and specifically writing this commercial material. I've heard at points that Spencer Proffer was kind of a, a, he kind of pushed them in that direction a lot and pushed a lot of artists in that direction. But I did, I do think they did the commercial thing a lot better on the next record QR, which I actually really dig that record with Paul Shortino. I like that record quite a bit. So yes, Steven, what is your final thoughts and your rating? Well, my rating, <clears throat> finally I get to say it five out of 10. Half this record was good and half this record was bad. Just simply put half and half. And my high school education would tell me five is half of 10. Or is it? <laughs> no, please. Anyway, um, I mean, and actually, it's, it has 11 tracks. So actually, technically, that wouldn't add up. But anyway, <laughs> um, like more like five and a half. But anyway, that, that, that just shows my, 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 where my mind is right now of rambling on and <laughs> of, of shortness of things to say about this because... It's, I mean, it's when it's bad, I mean, you just don't have a lot to say and you just you start having to get creative with, with ways to say that it's bad, <laughs> um, you know, such as it's, it's bad, it's, it's, it's gruesome, it, it, it makes you fall out of a chair, um, break a chair, I mean, and I, I mean... I, w I would go as far as to say this song made me eat three Oreos at once in my mouth. So, I mean, I got a feeling a lot of this stuff is going to be edited out because, oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, this, I, I mean, I just don't know. I tried to try to listen to this record. And, I, I mean, I just, the second half of it, I could never catch on to, simply put. So there you go, five out of ten. And I'm not going to draw this any more out and be a destruction to your ears like this was to my ears, this album was. So, I mean, if you did listen to this record before, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's bad. Go back to you, Devin. All righty, so... Now we move on to our picks of the week. So, Stephen, I'm going to let you go with your picks of the week, your movie and music pick. So, Stephen, go right on ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to say the just off the wall, I mean, Batman, The Dark Knight Rises. Okay. Um, just off the wall because I thought, I thought about watching that. And... <clears throat> for seeing, you know, from the new Batman coming out, just watch going back a little ways. But, and from that, um, as far as movie, that's what that was. And for music, I would say I, I've been, I've been kind of trying different stuff. And, um, Dean, Dean has that's been on the podcast before has told me about some of these stuff and this certain album he told me about I thought was pretty decent it's called um hard line is double eclipse hard line being the the band name and double eclipse being the album name I'm pretty sure but uh it, me and him was hanging out the other day we listened to this and it was it was pretty good I mean it was it was pretty decent I don't know if, if Devin knows this band probably so knowing him but uh, anyway, besides that, that's all I got. So back to you, Devin. So my pick of the week or picks of the week, I had a hard time picking an album. I picked one, then I went back on it. I'm just going to go with the one I thought of first thing, and this is going to kind of piggyback off the one that you picked in the previous episode that we recorded 
different kind of truth. I want to pick Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble in step from 1989. I listened to that today, and it, it's a great record from start to finish. I have the remastered edition with the bonus songs, the live tracks, really good live stuff on there as well. So, yeah, in step is my album pick of the week my movie pick of the week this is also kind of piggybacking off of something steven watched and that is pet cemetery too so he saw the original pet cemetery but i i love the sequel the sequel to me is great i've probably picked it on here before but who the heck who knows we've done so many freaking episodes over the years so yeah pet cemetery too is my movie pick of the week so yeah that is our show for this week i hope you all enjoyed like comment subscribe share give us some feedback tell us what you like tell us what you don't like tell us if we need to stop tell us if we need to keep going (laughs) whatever the case may be either even if you tell us to stop we're not going to stop we're going to keep going so yeah that's the episode so i'll close this thing out like i usually do with God bless you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay frosty, and don't listen too down and dirty at all or the pump. So hope you all enjoyed this episode, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.